there's a subtext of World War I. There was much propaganda, of course, made about whose side God was on. If there were any people who had knew better, it was probably the Jews. Because they were on both sides, but they had very little indication that uh, God had anything to do with it. Uh, the participation of Jews in the various sides during World War I is rooted very much in the 19th century, during which Western Europe underwent what seemed like a period of enlightenment. In Prussia, there had been a religious tolerance on the books since the days of uh, Frederick the Great, and most of Western Europe was seen to be opening up to, this, to a general uh, tolerance of all, universal tolerance, and the Jews who were pretty much stuck out there by the diaspora were embracing this wholeheartedly and responding with a, an increased patriotism and a desire to return the favor to whatever country they were living in. They ate up the culture of the country they were in, they identified with the country. Uh, I can speak from experience how what a patriotic Hungarian my grandmother was on my father's side before she came to the U.S. And they had a great cultural renaissance that occurred throughout, throughout Europe. And yet, as nationalism proliferated and also drew the two sides toward disaster in 1914, there was also an undercurrent of anti-Semitism that just refused to go away and kept bubbling to the surface from time to time. Any, anything from uh, Richard Wagner's rantings against uh, Felix Mendelssohn, although in Wagner's case it was against just about every composer other than himself, <laughs> to uh, the Dreyfus Affair in France, where uh, Capi artillery Capitaine Alfred Dreyfus was convicted of espionage, sent to Devil's Island, and even after it was found out that it was in fact Count Esterhazy who had been the spy, uh, in the wake of the Franco-Prussian War, the French army felt that it could not publicly admit that it was wrong, and so continued to persecute <coughs> Dreyfus. He was, uh, it was an ugly business in which the French finally did acquit Dreyfus, during which anti-Semitism reared its head again in France as that was used as an argument to prove that he was a traitor because they're all traitors, they're not really French. This feeling of foreignness was something that was a very sensitive issue to the Jews throughout Europe. It literally divided France's soul in two between Dreyfusards and anti-Dreyfusards. But this also made it clear uh, that uh, things were not quite what they seemed in any of these countries on, on a social level. And these were, this was the dichotomy the Jews faced. Nevertheless, when World War I broke out, many of them seized it as another chance to show the countries they were in how much they identified with those countries. And they joined their respective armies and air arms with great enthusiasm, at least in Western Europe. Uh, they were often kept out of... Uh, some occupations, and it, particularly when the fighter plane became that elite of the sky, it was rather difficult for them to rate uh, those planes as opposed to the workhorses of reconnaissance or bombing. And in the case of other countries, such as Russia, they were lucky if they could get into the air service at all. Russia probably had the greatest amount of Jews fighting in World War I, and they were virtually all in infantry units as cannon fodder. Whereas uh, in countries like Britain, or especially France, which was compensating for its past injustices, 
there were much more opportunities. Now, out of this relative, there was probably an, a greater proportion of Germany's Jewish population who were joining the army or and the Luftstreitskräfte than, uh, than their actual numbers uh, in proportion. And uh, two of them became aces. And as we'll see, a handful of others managed to get that extra elite status. And they each had an, a very individualistic uh, story to tell. Now, the, what is showing on, on the uh, screen right now is one of the inspirations for this whole thing, Heinz Navarra's book on uh, the Jew with the poor le mérite. Wilhelm Frankl. All right, how do we do this? Uh, just click the space bar. Space bar. Space bar. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilhelm Frankl, who is shown here test flying a Fokker D1, he and the Germany's other Jewish ace have have one thing in common. They were both pre-war flyers, and that helped a lot in their case. They both made a name for themselves at a time when aircraft were just starting. They were what the Germans called Alte Adler, the old eagles. Uh, Wilhelm Frankl was born on December 20th, 1893 in Hamburg, the son of a Jewish salesman. He learned to fly, got his license on July 20th, 1913. When he entered service, he was an observer in Feldflieger Abteilung 40 in Flanders. And by the end of 1915, he had risen to the rank of Vizefeldwebel. During that time, on May 10th, he brought down a voisin pusher for his first victory. Using carbine fire, as a matter of fact, he later became one of the first to transfer to single seaters, but not before he and he uh, joined Kampfeinsitzer Kommando Vogt in uh, flying uh, Falz and mostly Fokker Eindeckers. On January 10th, he got a voisin. On the 19th, he got another. On February 1st, yet another, and on. And then he started to deal with the British, um, a BE-2C on May 4th, 1916. And on uh, May 21st, he brought down FE-2B 5206 of number 20 squadron, crewed by uh, Captain C.E.H. James on the uh, left, and 2nd uh, Lieutenant H.C.C. Agat on the right. They were taken prisoner at Hukum. Uh, at this point, his score lay at 6. He brought down a Moran Sonnier parasol on August 2nd. On the 10th, he got another voisin, another plane, on uh, the same day. At that point, what, when a German pilot got eight or more, it at that stage of the war, it was pretty guaranteed that he would get the Orden pour la Marie. This was uh, a medal for consistent excellence in combat, awarded only to officers. By this time, uh, he had advanced from Wietzefeld Webel to Leutnant. He continued to score with a new pour on September 7th, another on the 15th. At that point, however, he had changed units to one of the new Jagdstaffeln, Yasta IV, with, where he rose to be the commander. He got an FE-2B on September 17th, the same day that uh, Manfred von Richthofen contributed to Yasta Belke's score. He got a Caudron on September 26th, a Newport on October 10th, a Sopwith on October 22nd. And then he took off some leave to test fly both Fokkers on Fouts 
aircraft. This shows him later as commander of Yasta IV. It was also in early 1917 that fate took another turn for uh, Frankel. He fell in love with the daughter of a visiting Austro-Hungarian naval officer who was a uh, Catholic and she would not marry him unless he converted. He did a lot of soul searching. Apparently he was head over heels enough to convert. They were married shortly after, but then it was off to the front for him again. He received one of the first of the new Albatross D3s to arrive at the Staffel, uh, number 1958-16. And on April 6th, his career reached its peak. He started off at 02.30 in the morning when he brought down an FE-2B of number 100 squadron. It was one of the first night victories for the uh, Luftschweizkräfte. But the day was young for Frankel. He got another FE-2B at 08.50 in the morning, another five minutes later, and another an hour later. That's four in one day. That's a record that n only uh, a few Germans would meet, starting with the Red Baron later that same month. His 20th victory occurred on April 7th, a Newport 17. And then on April 8th, he led the Staffel in an attack on some newfangled British two-seaters, which had had a disastrous start just two days earlier when the Red Baron and his circus had knocked down four of them. But uh, the British had worked out better tactics for the use of these Bristol F-2As, and when Yasta IV descended on them, they were much more likely to use these new planes as fighter, single-seat fighters with a sting in the tail. And uh, the result was that two albatross out of control were claimed by Captain David M. Tidmarsh and his well, the British jointly credited these to the teams of Captain Tidmarsh, 2nd Lieutenant C.B. Holland, 2nd Lieutenant Oswald W. Berry and F.B. Goodison, and another one to the three teams, 2nd Lieutenants George Brockhurst and C.B. Broughton, Robert E. Adney, Leslie G. Lovell, A.J. Riley, and L.G. Hall. Both were classified as out of control. Uh, usually out of control did not mean that they'd shot them down, but on this one occasion, one of them was definitely crashing to earth. It was Albatross D3, 1958-16, and it carried uh, Wilhelm Frankl to his death. There is a tragic uh, sort of uh, epilogue to his story. A good many German Jews felt betrayed by his conversion and were not sure that he should even be considered Jewish anymore after having abandoned his strictly monotheistic faith to convert. But the Nazis considered him Jewish enough and in their records, I saw one of their 1938 books, uh, which was a, a collection of biographies of their uh, Pour le Merit Flieger from World War I. On one of the pages, it simply says Frankel, and has a cross next to it to indicate he was killed in action. No first name, no life story, no photograph, nothing else. He was an embarrassment to the Nazi claim that all the Jews had stayed at home making money at the expense of the soldiers and stabbing Germany in the back. 
I happen to have a book that was written in 1924, shortly after the Beer Hall Putsch, that was devoted to the Jewish flyers who'd served in the First World War. It includes a number of names you may be familiar with. It includes Frankel, for all the good that would do when the Nazis took power nine years later. Frankel's story is one of the better known ones. He would finally be uh, given his due, and here it's being visited by some uh, World War I and II pilots, including Theo Osterkamp on the right, Germany's leading World War I naval ace, and my late friend Günther Rahl, third-ranking Luftwaffe ace of World War II, with 275 victories, uh, second from the right. John, where's that picture taken? Do you know location? I'm afraid I don't. I think that's an F-86K. Yes. It very well may be, because the Germans on this occasion also, uh, they are still in the habit of naming their Jagdischwader after famous flyers, and Jagdgeschwader 74 is now known as Der Frankelgeschwader. What, what I'm curious about is, I don't think the Germans flew that airplane. That's, that's why I'm curious about the location. I think they did see They did. Not, not the F-86K. Yeah, the K. Did they have the K? I don't think they did. Yeah, they did. I think they had at least one air defense unit where they got Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Have to look for that. Yeah, but that's what, obviously the biggest part they were. Okay. See what unit that is. Yeah. Germany's other Jewish ace was also a pre-war flyer. Willy Rosenstein was born in Stuttgart on January 28, 1892. He got pilot's license number 170 on March 14, 1912, became an instructor at Johannesthal where he had learned at the hands of Germany's first licensed female flyer, uh, Melly Beza, and worked at Edmund Rumpler's school at Johannesthal in 1913. When war broke out, he volunteered, served initially with the 95th Infantry Regiment before being before somebody noticed that this fellow is a uh, fairly well-known pre-war flyer, he was then sent to the flying school at Gotha on August 24th, 1914. Trained at uh, Abteilung 5, promoted to Unteroffizier, sent as a Wiezefeldwebel on November 24th to join Fliegerabteilung 19 on March 6th, 1915. He earned the Iron Cross second class on the 29th, and on 21st August received the Württemberg Silver Military Service Medal. On January 7th, February 17th, 1916, he was commissioned a lieutenant, but was wounded over Verdun on April 28th. I've determined that uh, he and Lieutenant Irvin Martin his uh, observer had been driven down in German lines, wounded by Sergeant Marc Trevier and Lieutenant Emmanuel Ulysse Granger of uh, Escadrille MF 33, who were flying a Farman F 40 and who claimed a by place that fell in French lines. After uh, Completing 180 sorties, he received the Iron Cross first class, and once he recovered from his wounds, he reported to Fokker's section of the Third Army, which would later become Yasta 9 on September 23rd. He would serve fairly well with them from September 23rd. Then on February 15, 1917, he was transferred to Jagdstaffel 27. There he scored his first victory on September 21st, 1917, while interestingly enough, flying 
an older Albatros D3, which was actually probably a better choice than the weak D5s that were considered the latest of the line. He was also flying a D3 when he shot, his first victim was a de Havilland DH-4, his second, a camel, went down on September 26th. It was from number 70 squadron. And some stories say that he had shot it off the tail of his Staffelfuhrer, thus saving his life. Perhaps this story is just for the sake of uh, irony, because his Staffelführer at the time was one Hermann Göring, who at the time had a pretty good reputation as uh, a Staffelführer, but uh, as we now know, tended to live in something of a world of his own, and also had a tendency to let the anti-Semitism that had pervaded him from childhood to bubble to the surface, which is what happened sometime after uh, Rosenstein's second victory. He made a, uh, well, as Rosenstein himself put it, I had a personal quarrel with Goering caused by an anti-Semitic remark in front of our comrades in the officer's mess. I felt compelled to demand its retraction. These circumstances caused me to apply for transfer to a home defense unit, which was granted a short time later. Well, that's an interesting part of the story to which an even more interesting matter is that Goering, uh, apparently to cover his uh, butt, gave a... Uh, gave a surprising sort of uh, letter of recommendation as he transferred uh, Rosenstein out. I quote Goering, Leutnant in der Reserve Rosenstein was a member of Jahr Staffel 27 from 12 February 1917 through 10 December 1917. During this period, he has won confidence of his Staffelführer due to his aggressiveness in aerial combat and the affection of his Staffelkamerad because of his fine comradeship. Lately, he has shown signs of some nervous exhaustion, which must be the consequence of his nearly six years of continuous activity as a combat pilot. Therefore, I suggest an assignment at a KEST, that's a confines, it's a Staffel or home defense unit, uh, may be useful for his recovery, enabling him at the same time to remain current in his flying ability. I am confident that in view of his constitution, he will be fit for deployment to the front lines next spring. Uh, the one thing Goering did not want to do was, uh, of course, admit he was wrong or make a retraction. And the day that uh, Rosenstein transferred out, he made a point of not being at the Staffel. Nevertheless, after a time with the, the confines of the Staffel, uh, Rosenstein was chosen. He had been serving with Kest 1B, and he scored his third victory over Hagenau Karlsruhe when he shot down another DH-4. On July 2nd, he was posted to a new unit, Saxon Jagdstaffel 40, under Leutnant in the Reserve of Karl Degelov, who turned out to be a very different person from Goering. Um, he was made executive officer of the unit, and as Degelov put it, of all of us, Vili was one of the few really professional pilots. He became one of the most trusted members of the unit, and his score began to show it. He began scoring more regularly, an SE-5A on July 2014th, a Bristol fighter on September 29th, one of four SPAD 13s they claimed on August 3rd, although in actuality French SPAF 82 lost only three, but 
That's dog fights for you. October 4th, a camel. October 7th, another. The 27th, yet another. When the war ended then, uh, at Degelov's request, and by the way, Degelov would be the last German with 30 victories to his credit to receive the Orden pour le Marit before the war ended. Uh, Rosenstein was awarded the Knight's Cross second class with swords of the Order of the Tsaringa Lion, the Hohenzollern House Order, although the, it was not awarded before the war ended. After the war he became a sport glider pilot, but as the Nazis took power, he realized he had to get out. The question was getting permission to leave. Well, Degelov and another German ace, Josef Jacobs, personally confronted Goering to sign the papers that would allow uh, Rosenstein to leave. Allegedly, Goering roared like a bull that he had better things to do and he, he had ways of dealing with Jew lovers like these two. But uh, both Degelov and Jacobs stood their ground and reminded him of, of uh, Rosenstein's record, including in Yasta 27, and Goering suddenly signed the exit papers and threw it at them and said, give them to him before I change my mind. And uh, so Rosenstein was able to emigrate to South Africa, where he continued his flying career, he uh, also took up a farm at Rostenburg, and he, uh, his son, Ernest, joined the South African Air Force, but was killed in action over Italy on, to ground fire on April 2nd, 1945, just a little more than a month before the war ended. Rosenstein himself was killed in a flying accident in May 1949 at his farm in Rostenburg. Well, that's the story of the German aces, but as I mentioned earlier, one reason the Jews questioned the idea of whose side God was on was because they were very aware that their religious brethren were also flying on the other side. And as a matter of fact, uh, the highest scoring one on the Allied side, pretty close to matched uh, wrote, uh, Frankel's score. This is Karl Degelov with his Spocker D7 with a uh, white heart emblem. Rosenstein's plane. This is a lineup of Yasta 40's planes which had black fuselages and white tails. And there are some of the boys playing around with Degelov. This includes uh, Rosenstein, who's looking discreetly uh, aloof from the matter, and also Hans Jeschenek, who scored two victories and would later be in charge of supplying aircraft to the Luftwaffe and would later commit suicide during the war after having committed most of Germany's training aircraft and pilots to the Russian front, leaving them with too few to train new generations of men. And when that caught up, uh, he killed himself. And this is uh, Rosenstein's plane. He apparently was popular among the ladies. And uh, after all the ribbing he got from his uh, Stoffel mates, uh, he put a white heart on the side of his plane. Uh, this was the leading allied Jewish ace, uh, Jacques Ehrlich, born in Paris, October 5th, 19, 1893. He was serving in the infantry as of even before the war, on May 29, 1913, but 
Early in the war, he became inspired by the exploits of that universal idol of the French, uh, Georges Guinemer, and wanted to follow in his footsteps. So he put in a request to, uh, to uh, join the Aeronautique Militaire. He joined Escadrille N-154, and had a frustrating first year, during which he was wounded in a trench strafing mission on August 10th, 1917. But under the tutelage of uh, Lieutenant Michel Coiffard, the tough leader of the outfit, uh, Spa 124, re-equipped with spads, began to get into the balloon-busting business. <clears throat> and as such, uh, their approach was very much a team effort, and Ehrlich often joined Coiffard, Louis Gross, uh, Jacques uh, Paul Petit, and an American volunteer, Wainwright Abbott, in mass attacks on balloons with each of them getting credit. Another of his squadron mates was Robert Waddington, who was a, uh, in spite of the name, happened to be French, but his family had originated in England and had moved there in 1800. Uh, he gave me an interesting description of the squadron, including uh, Ehrlich. He said during my interview, Coiffard was a real trainer of men, a bit brutal, but an exceptional energy of courage. Concerning Ehrlich, he was 100% Jew as regards his aspect, demeanor, etc., but qu quite non-religious, and nobody attached the smallest importance to the fact that he was Israelite. I remember we had the most burning hot quarrels about his cynical view of life, but he was really easy to get along with and a good friend of mine. Uh, he also added that, uh, as you know, fighter pilots had long hours without flying during the winter, and we practically never flew at night. So we used to play cards a lot, and Ehrlich was an ardent player of poker. Spa 154 was well known for that. Was it due to the life of risks and perils we were leading? As fatality is concerned, we were more or less fatalists. Death was with us every day, but luck was also a reality. Some of us had luck, my case, others had none. Real fighters were, do were doomed from the start if they had no luck. In fact, we were all very young and seldom mentioned death. I don't think there was any so-called rivalry between fighters and aces. During a flight or an attack when flying, a team did the utmost to help defend and protect the others. Coffard and Ehrlich are, in my opinion, very good examples of that fact, for I am sure the idea of surpassing Coffard never crossed Ehrlich's mind. At least 15 of their victories were achieved together. Uh, this is a lineup of some of the Spa 152's men. Uh, there is uh, Coffard. Paul Barbro, who often collaborated in their victories. There's Ehrlich, also Wainwright Abbott, their American Lafayette Flying Corps volunteer, and a couple of U.S. Army Air Service men who were assigned to them. Uh, who, Victor Picard, who I corresponded with, Alvin Treadwell, who would score four victories but would be killed in action, Paul Petit, who also uh, figured in a lot of their mutual victories. In total, Coffard would end up with 35 victories, of which 26 were balloons, and Ehrlich would end up with 18 balloons and one airplane, before his luck ran out on September 18, 1918, when after getting his 18th balloon, he and his flight were attacked by Fokker D-7s of Yasta 66. Petit was mortally wounded. Ehrlich was brought down and taken prisoner. Coiffard would also be killed before the war would ended. After the war, um, Ehrlich would be uh, 
fight on in the French resistance in World War II, and he would die in 1953. Uh, Wainwright Abbott, who I also corresponded with, uh, mentioned to me that uh, he was also good friends with Ehrlich, who he described as uh, a light-haired Jew with flashing light blue eyes and unusually animated and, uh, and amusing. So he certainly made a good impression among his friends. Another one, in a much different front, was uh, Sergeant André Lévy. Oh, this is the final resting place of Jacques Ehrlich in Paris. August 10th, 1953 was when he died. Uh, André Lévy was another Parisian, born June 6, 1893, served in the infantry, transferred to aviation on October 8, 1916, flew Farman's with Escadrille F-29, flew a SOP with 1A-2 when he shared credit for downing an enemy plane over Berry on April 7, 1917 and then was assigned to Escadrille N-561 on May 16th. He would, uh, this unit was based in Lido outside of Venice, and their job was to patrol both uh, the Piave front and the Adriatic. Typical for uh, Levy was this Nucor 723, which bears the the Mastiff dog that was his personal marking. Everyone in the unit had a personal marking. There was no Escadrille emblem for 561. And that also would appear on his spans. Uh, Lévy uh, would shoot uh, with Maréchal de Logis Edmond Cornillon, would shoot down an Austro-Hungarian float plane on November 16th. And uh, he would later score victories on June 21st, July 20th, and August 5th, 1918. His luck ran out on September 16th when he burned a balloon of Boulogne Compagnie 3 west of Tsegia, but anti-aircraft fire from Luftfahrzeug Abwehr Battery 6 de stroke 146 struck his SPAD 13 severed his fuel line, and he, he deliberately made a hard landing, buckling his undercarriage and flipping his plane on its back to prevent it from serving the enemy. He then, shortly after being taken prisoner, made an escape attempt, but was caught. Later, on uh, November 2nd, 1918, he succeeded in escaping from Mulbach prison camp, traversed a 2,500 meter mountain through two and a half feet of snow on foot, managed to reach Italian lines on November 5th, and rejoined his escadrille in Lido on the 6th. So we have a rather tough cookie here. In addition to being made a Chevalier de la Légion d'honneur and getting the Médaille Militaire and the Croix de Guerre with two stars of bronze, Levy was awarded the Italian Croce de Guerra, two Medaglia d'Oro al Valore Militare, and two Medaglia Bronzo al Valore Militare. He died on March 12, 1973. There is another French observer who's, uh, who may or may not rate as an ace, uh, Eugène Lévy, nevertheless, has a history interesting enough to mention here and in my upcoming book on reconnaissance and bomber aces. Uh, Lévy was uh, also a Parisian. He was born to a doctor. And uh, at age 12, in 1909, while he was visiting a cousin in Le Mans, they roped off a section of field near there because a visiting American was going to demonstrate this brand new contraption he'd invented. 
It was a windy day, and the American said he would like to take a passenger up, but it would have to be the youngest, lightest person around. Uh, Weissman raised his hand, and at age 12, he got the privilege of being able to fly alongside Wilbur Wright. That would get him interested in aviation, although... For much of World War I, he served in the infantry, specifically the 28th, and felt done after driving back a German attack. Uh, a grenade fell behind him and uh, tore up his, his feet, which had to be amputated. With the help of his father, he learned to walk on prosthetics. Uh, served at a gunnery school and then requested to return to the front as an observer. He was transferred to Escadrille BR-134 and with that unit he began uh, to score victories on three occasions. And on September 14th he went on a particularly uh, hazardous bombing attack on Conflans railroad junction, and during the return he stated that the wind was so hard in their faces that it took them 45 minutes to fight their way through a flock of Fokker D-7s of Yasta 13. They lost four planes, they claimed four Fokkers. Uh, some French sources uh, gave the credit to all the crews mutually, including that of uh, Sun Lieutenant Eugène Weissman and his commander, uh, Capitaine Jean Jeannequin. Others give them just the one. So either uh, Jeannequin comes off with five victories or two, and uh, Weiss Weissman ends up with either four or seven. Things took an interesting turn after the war. Both men continued in the service. Both were made officier de la Légion d'honneur. In World War II, though, Jeannequin continued his career in the Air Force under Vichy, put up a, a spirited fight against the British in Syria in 1941, and after his repatriation, continued to be a good friend of the Germans. Obviously, for Weissmann, this was not an option. He was dismissed from the Air Force, returned to Paris, which was in the northern part of France, which was under direct Nazi control, and disappeared until August 1944, when he turned up leading the resistance in the Neuilly district of Paris. And with the liberation of Paris, he became the liaison of the Force Française de l'Intérieur, to General Omar Bradley. He also flew as an observer in artillery spotting aircraft to call artillery on German positions, in one case blowing up an ammo dump. He became one of France's most decorated heroes by the time he died on July 14, 1973, Bastille Day, and was buried in Paris. Uh, Jean Jeannequin, who ended up doing two years as a collaborateur, is also buried in Paris by ironic coincidence. This is Weissman shortly after World War II. And this is his grave in Paris. Now we get to some of the other nationalities that you probably heard even less of. For example, uh, Solomon Clifford Joseph, born in Birmingham, April 29, 1893, joined the Royal Naval Air Service in August 1917. Hardly the sort of person who would hide behind money, Joseph was the son of a millionaire, but still wanted to do his bit, or maybe he just wanted the thrill of it all. In any case, he learned to fly Sopwith camels, and, but he didn't come into his own until after the unit 
became number 210 Squadron Royal Air Force, and then he started to pile up the victories. Starting on May 7th, 1918, with an Albatross D-5 over Armentier, <coughs> and he would continue to score steadily from then on, often collaborating with fellow squadron mates such as uh, Nick Carter from Canada, Clement Payton from England, and J.A. Lewis and J. Ian C. Sanderson in some of the shared victories. He was wounded on September 24, 1918, but he was back in action by October 30th to use this plane, also associated with American ace Fred Unger, to shoot down a Fokker D-7 on October 30th for his 13th victory of the war. In the course of things, uh, Joseph ended up getting the Distinguished Flying Cross and Bar. On uh, April 4th, 1919, he went on the RAF's unemployment list. On November 24th, 25, he dissolved a partnership in an ammunition recycling business. April 8th, 1927, he turned up acting as executor to post notice of probate for the estate of Michael Joseph. But he is best known for forming the Clifford Group, a corporation in Birmingham that would include the Clifford Arrow and Ojo Limited, Clifford Covering, which made most of the steering wheels for Br the British auto industry, Clifford Cultivators Limited, Motor Components, Strata Truck Forklift Trucks, Clifford Products, Clifford Machine Tools, and Clifford Developments. Among other things, during World War II, his company would build parts for Supermarine Spitfires and Avril Lancasters. In the 1930s, he married Oscar Deutsch's widow, Deutsch being the founder of the Odeon Cinemas. He died on March 21st, 1966. Another rather unusual uh, addition to the roster of Jewish aces is uh, Roy Manzer. He was born in uh, Maple Creek, Saskatchewan, on August 31st, 1896, a place which 11 years earlier had been the scene of the Riel Rebellion in Canada's Wild West. In 1917, he enlisted in the Canadian Officer Training Corps, as it then switched to the Royal Flying Corps in June, got his second lieutenant's commission on October 24th, Five days later, shipped out for Britain. After further training, on March 16th, he was posted to the Canadian Expeditionary Force in France and then assigned on the 19th to number 84 Squadron, Royal Air Force. 84 Squadron, under uh, Major William Sholto Douglas, was uh, one of the earliest units to be equipped with the SE-5A, and uh, Manzer had the good, uh, the good fortune to be uh, put under, uh, in a flight under the command of Lieutenant Hugh Saunders, better known as Dingbat Saunders, a South African, so named because of, he used that term for just about everything. As he told me, it, it's an Afrikaans term meaning thingamabob or whatchamacallit. <laughs> but it was under, uh, uh, 84 Squadron also had the uh, distinction of having the most Americans of any fighter squadron in the Royal Air Force, total of nine, two of whom would become aces, starting with uh, Jens Larsen, otherwise known as Swede Larsen, who scored six victories before illness drove him out of the unit. Uh, throughout the German Kaiserschlacht, uh, Manzer started to add to his score. He destroyed 
failed to burn a kite balloon, although he did manage to drive a crew to its parachutes. On the morning of May 15th, Manzer and Saunders claimed to have driven down two of three two-seaters they saw, taking off from Vauvier, before being chased back over the lines by several Fokker DR1s. Those victories were not credited. But later they would have one of several run-ins with the Red Baron's Flying Circus. And on, on one occasion, uh, well, here's how H.P. Uh, Smith described it. When they were uh, escorting home a formation of the Haviland DH-4s that same day from a bombing attack on Schoen, we're talking May 15, 1918 here, several Albatross D-5As appeared over the bombers. Smith dived on one of them, f fired 400 rounds, and saw a crash near Rosier. I started back for our own lines when I felt a blow on the right ankle and I found I was wounded. Looking round, I saw an enemy triplane on my tail. At the same time, my petrol tank was hit and the engine stopped. I dived for our lines, kicking the rudder as I went. The triplane followed, but finally gave up the chase. He forced landed in no man's land near Vie Bretonneur. He was wounded twice more before he made it to Australian trenches. He was credited to Leutnant Richard Wenzel of Yasta VI. This was a component of Yagishvatar I, the Baron Circus. Meanwhile, the rest of the flight was engaging other Yasta VI Fokkers, which Saunders described as having checkerboard wings. Picking out a triplane pursuing the bombers, Saunders peppered the engine and fuselage of Wietzefeld Babel Franz Hammer's DR-1. Leutnant Waldemar Moritz Brettschneider Bodemer tried to intervene, but came across Manzer's bow at 800 yards and came under attack by him. Both Germans spun down with the SE-5As diving in hot pursuit. Saunders came within 10 yards before pulling away to avoid a collision. Manzer dived some 2,000 feet after Brettschneider, loosing volleys as he closed to 50 yards before disengaging. They were both credited with the uh, triplanes. But in fact, uh, Hamer and Brett Schneider somehow managed to make it back home, shot up, but themselves unharmed. The, uh, they continued to score uh, steadily, and uh, on the morning of May 28th, they flight dove on eight Albatross. Manzer drove one down out of control, southeast of Varfizé then came under attack as he took evasive action. His assailant overshot him, and Manzer struck the right upper wing with his undercarriage. He managed to right his SE-5A, saw the albatross descending minus its right wing, or so he perceived. Uh, Saunders and Cecil Wilson were also credited with albatross out of control. But the only thing German records indicate is that Unteroffizier Josef Diem of Yasta 76 was uh, credited with an SE-5A. He probably thought he had downed Manzer, while Manzer thought he had finished him. On June 18th, Manzer became an ace in a fight with 15 German fighters during which uh, he got a uh, triplane. On July 9th, he was leading two new arrivals in the unit, 2nd Lieutenant Cecil R. Thompson from South Africa and 1st Lieutenant George A. Vaughn, Jr. from Brooklyn, New York, whose SE-5A is shown at the left in this picture. And uh, Manza reported as follows when he had to go with some fresh prey. Whilst leading B flight over Proyard, I decided to have a cut at a balloon. I took my flight just north of the Somme and came down on the balloon from the northwest. I waited until I was about 500 feet from him and opened up with my Vickers. At 150 feet, I started with Buckingham, but after 10 runs, the guns jammed. The observer jumped from the balloon, and the balloon was pulled down at once. 
Both Lieutenants Vaughn and Thompson also fired at the balloon from close range. We did not leave the balloon until we went down about 400 feet, where we turned west and contour chased home under heavy fire from the ground. I might add that number 84 squadron would produce the highest scoring balloon buster in the RAF, uh, Anthony Weatherby Beecham Proctor from South Africa, with 54 victories, 16 of which were balloons, and the Victoria Cross. But on this occasion, uh, Manzer learned that balloons were not that easy. He did get a citation, however, for the Distinguished Flying Cross. While carrying out a solitary patrol, he observed a two-seater below him. Diving on it, he opened fire and following it down to a thousand feet, caused it to land outside the aerodrome. During his return to our lines, he saw a hostile kite balloon attacking it as it was being hauled down. He closed a point-blank range and 300 feet altitude. On reaching the ground, the balloon burst into flames. In addition to the above, this officer has accounted for seven enemy machines, four of which were destroyed and three driven down out of control. On another patrol that afternoon, Manzer and Vaughn attacked a two-seater, hitting the observer and forcing it to land in a field near Fu Fukukor Airfield. That went unconfirmed, but they would collaborate again. On July 14th and 20th, the French stopped the Germans' last attempt to storm the Marne River, and the Allies went over to the offensive. Manzer was leading a B-flight patrol on the 28th when he spotted a rumbler and dived on it, joined by Vaughn in close attendance. Attacking from underneath, Manzer fired about 300 rounds into the two-seater and saw it dive into the ground near Harbonnier at 0940, jointly credited to both men. At 0800 the next morning, Saunders led a morning patrol against two-seaters. He downed an LVG while Lieutenants Norman W. Maul and A.C. Lobley got another, and Manzer and Vaughn dispatched a rumpler one mile east of the wood. On August 3rd, Manzer got a D-7 in flames at Bray. At 0830 the next morning, it destroyed an albatross west of Warfuse. And on the 6th, he was put in charge of sea flight. He was leading his new command on the 7th when he saw Lieutenant Maul's flight engage with 15 enemy fighters over Le Canel. Maul accounted for two of them. Manzer went in and sent a false crashing to the ground east of Le Canel at 0910 hours. And 2nd Lieutenant Ruggles Thompson drove down a second false, and a Fokker D7 fell to. William J. Nell. The next day saw the launching of the Great British Offensive and the Black Day of the German Army, the Amiens Offensive of August 8th. As General Henry Rawlinson's Fourth Army, including the Canadian and Australian Corps, advanced along an 11 mile wide front from south of the Amiens Roi Road to Morlancourt. Morning fog limited air operations. But uh, at 10 hundred hours, 84 Squadron was up and active doing ground attack and scouting. It was during this time that Manzer's luck ran out. Oh, this is a shot of him with some of his squadron mates, including Nell, Dingbat Saunders, and George Vaughn who would end up with 13 victories, seven with the British and six later with the U.S. Army Air Service. And one of the nicest guys I ever met. In any case, uh, Manzer's luck ran out. Hit by ground fire, his SE-5A crashed in German lines. He was taken prisoner, and for him, the war was over. He was released from captivity on all December 13, 1918, went on the unemployed list on March 12, 1919, joined the Royal Canadian Artillery, and then completed his law studies at the University of Toronto. He returned to his western roots then, joining the law firm of Blackstock and Clough in Medicine Hat, Alberta. 
1923 became one of the principal solicitors in what became Blackstock, Clough, and Manzer. And in 1924, he joined the bar as a partner at Manzer and Wooten in Victoria, British Columbia. Besides his law practice, Manzer got into the mining business in 1940 as director of Slade Places Limited. In 44, he was registrar to the Diocese of British Columbia. From 47 to 49, he was the unpaid reeve to the District of Oak Bay. His ultimate achievement was when he took silk as Queen's Counsel for British Columbia prior to his death on August 26, 1956, just short of his 60th birthday. Our final Jewish ace is closer to home. Jacques Swab, son of a millionaire, businessman named Meyer Swab from Philadelphia. He too wanted to do his bit. He was of Swabian descent, but managed to join the U.S. Army Air Service, and like, unlike a good many of his religious brethren, he managed to uh, end up in fighters, although through a method that was uh, a bit unorthodox. According to Temple Joyce, who was one of our greatest uh, test pilots of World War I, and mind you, being a test pilot was not an easy business. Usually the first thing you'd find out is that your plane was faulty. It was often also the last thing. So nobody really wanted to go into uh, test piloting, but harebrained uh, Swab was having a, a problem. He didn't think he would work as a combat pilot. He knew Joyce, and he allegedly came up to him and said, Temp, can you get me a job as a test pilot? I got orders for the front, and you know I can't fly worth a damn. If they send me up there, I know I'm going to get killed. Joyce answered, nobody ever volunteers for test flying. You get drafted for that. I'll volunteer. Just get me a job as a test pilot. I need more time in the air. So Joyce brought uh, Swab's petition to the training base at Isidon, and uh, told the Major about Swab's intention, to which the Major replied, Sign the damn fool up right away! <laughs> Swab's career as a test pilot would be very short. He would... Uh, his first was to make a perfect three-point landing, ten feet above the ground, after which the plane pancaked. The second time, he managed a ground loop that managed to break off both lower wings. At that point, uh, the, uh, commanding, the commander of the test pilots called Temple Joyce back in and said, uh, For God's sake, send that damn fool back to the front. He's much safer there than here. So uh, Swab was just uh, practically uh, paralyzed with fear when Joyce told him that he was getting a reassignment to combat. He was sent to the 22nd Aero Squadron, which was just forming about that time. And uh, of course, he, uh, he made the most of things by... Uh, christening his first spad Meyer after his father. Among the friends he made there was Arthur Raymond Brooks, who was another of the nicest guys I ever met. He was a guy from Framington, Massachusetts, who also nicknamed his plane Smith after his fiancé's college. He, he said he could have named it Ruth, but the idea of mechanics saying Ruth needs her nose fixed or Ruth's empanage is full of holes just didn't appeal to him. Another friend he made was Clinton Jones. All three of these people were to end up being aces later. Uh, Swab continued to prudently take his time trying to get used to being over the front. But uh, on September 8th, 1918, he uh, 
He went on a rather memorable fir- a patrol that would result in his first combat, and I will let Swab describe it in his own y- unique way. After our formation was broken up over Metz by the barrage of Archie, I found myself alone over German soil and above the clouds, which were so thick that the earth was hidden. I knew that running into the sun would take me home, so for it I headed until my imagination pictured me above friends once more. I shot through the clouds, and there before me was an aerodrome and not a plane in sight. Prudence told me to go down slowly. Then, when 200 meters from the field, my eyes almost popped out of my head when I saw a Fokker, the first for me, rising from the field at right angles to me. Just about the moment I said au revoir to myself in my very best French, the last I expected to use for some time, and dove at the Fokkers, uh, opening both guns, one of which was jammed. But what a glorious sight I saw. Flames burst out over the plane, and I circled it and saw it crash in flames. 4,700,000 4,700,000 machine guns chased me off the field, soon to be followed by onions and archies, which came damnably close when flying at a few hundred meters. Oh, friendly sun! Every time I managed to get a look at it through the clouds, it had moved further away. Finally, I managed to mount through the clouds. For a few miles, I almost enjoyed myself. Shading my eyes against old Saul, I saw a wing a very unfriendly wing, at which I fired. A Fokker made a steep spiral and ended up in a steep nosedive. The next instant, I saw a group of about ten Fokkers that enticed me into a game of Ring Around the Rosie, in which the object seemed to be for each one to take turn and practice aerial gunnery on me. Fortune permitted me to get closer and closer to a cloud. When one chap who'd worked for Buffalo Bill shooting pennies off a blind man's head, mistook me for his old partner, and missed, gently touching my scalp with three bullets. The cloud had come closer to me, and I headed for it, when an unfortunate Bosch got in the way of some American-made bullets and burst into flames. I made the cloud, vrilled a billion meters three times, passed away in a sunny consciousness, and next found myself pinned under my plane. French was being spoken. The people argued about my nationality, forgetting that the plane's occupant needed assistance until they were awakened by my saying, Leveille I knew that phrase perfectly. A year of seeing it on every machine had impressed it in my mind. They lifted the plane. I fell out. I crawled from under it. The next few words are not expressed, but I think you can guess what they were. (laughs) Hurry up with the ladder! But why say more? Those first two words told me I was among friends. The ladder was used as a stretcher with which to carry me away for repairs. (laughs) A Breguet bomber happened to have seen the spectacle. It seems that when his unit was diving at a steeper angle than he thought they were capable, uh, Swab had thought that they were bent on suicide to do so, and he went down much slower because he was used to flying Newports, not Spads. He didn't know that Spads would hold together in the dive. So he ended up lost, and that's when he got lost in a cloud, found himself over a German aerodrome, and had to fight his way out. But a passing Breguet bomber witnessed three of the Germans at least crash land, and he was credited with them. But as Brooks told me, uh, Swab was all in, and he ended up at a French spa trying to uh, get over a bad case of nerves. After his own experience taking on eight Fokkers single-handed and being credited with two of them, Brooks ended up at the same spa. Both of them eventually ended up feeling that looking at all these human wrecks around them, uh, they would be better off at the front than having to do that, and they both curtailed their uh, time there and went back to the 22nd. Later on, uh, 
Swab ran into Temple Joyce who heard about his how this how the man who was afraid that he'd get killed if he didn't get more airtime and managed to start off with three victories, asked how he managed to do this without getting shot down himself. Uh, and by the way, what about the fact that he was taking on a hundred of them? Swab said, well, actually, there were only ten, but I saw each one ten times. <laughs> Joyce then asked, well, how did he not get hit? Swab said, uh, well, to get it, he said, well, you know, I'm such, I'm, I don't know how to fly, and I, every time they were firing at me, I wouldn't be where I was supposed to be. <laughs> oh, here's how it was actually said. Temple said, uh, Jack, I can understand how you can just inadvertently figure the right deflection to get a guy, but why the devil didn't they get you? Well, Temp, you know I can't fly, and when the sons of guns aimed at me, I was either skidding or slipping, and they never got where I was supposed to be when they were firing. In, in spite of that, Swab had now found himself, and according to Brooks, who finished the war with six victories, and their other friend Clinton Jones had eight, Swab became the shooting star of the 22nd Aero Squadron with a total of ten, including, I've determined, at least one German ace who he brought down alive, in, who made it to German lines after getting a balloon, Max Netter, who ended up with, uh, I believe, 22 victories, but Swab managed to bring him down. Uh, Swab's last plane at the end of the war was Meyer 3, which bore the number 15, and his 10 victories around the shooting star that they belatedly adopted. I've recently discovered that because of the in, indifference of their commander uh, about it, they didn't apply a squadron insignia until the war was nearly over, contrary to a lot of our painter's attempts to depict them. In any case, uh, Swab would end up with a distinguished flying cross. He retired from the air service with the rank of captain, settled in Los Angeles, served as a technical consultant for the original movie version of the Dawn Patrol, became an early member of the Cross and Cockade Society, and was the main speaker at one of their earliest meetings. But his health was starting to deteriorate by 1962. He'd undergone an arterial operation and remained in ill health over the next year. He died at his home in L.A. on Sunday, July 7, 1963. Among those attending his funeral were four old acquaintances from World War I. General Carl A. Spots, former test pilot Victor Bowe, and former 22nd Aero Squadron mates Jack Sperry and Ray Brooks. These are just some of the characters that uh, added their spot of color to World War I, and who proved that religion was not a bar for heroism, nor was nationality. Any questions? general sense of what the average age of these fighter pilots was, and did it differ very much by nationality? I don't think it did. Uh, some had an upper limit and some had a lower limit, but there were a lot of people who sneaked their way in, either underage or overage. Uh, there were some who were as young as 16. Uh, the youngest of the, the youngest aces I know of were 18. And uh, some had, uh, some of the notable ones were 19. For example, uh, uh, David Putnam had 13 victories when he was killed on September 12, 1918, at age 19. And the German who shot him down, Georg von Handelmann, was only 19 at the time. He would end up with a total of 25. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people like uh, gunnery ace Adolphe Dubois Desch, who scored his sixth victory at age 43. And you have 
a determined German Jew by the name of, uh, see, which was that one? From Yasta 17, uh, Jakob Wolf, who got his fourth victory at age 48 or 49, if you read that in uh, Greg von Weingarten's book. So I would say the average was about anywhere from 20 to 25. Richthofen was 25 when he was killed. But uh, you could have people at a much older age, even in their 30s, and still making ace if that young man's game didn't catch up with them. You know, if that's... If I've squelched them all, then onward to the Eastern Front. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ken.